So, uh, hey, buddy. What's your name? I am the bro with Mohammed. Oh, yeah, you're that guy. With that, uh, you know, not Christianity, but like the other one. You know, the other, other one. This is correct. Oh, cool, man. Good to meet you. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, not a big fan, but, uh, it's always interesting to meet someone famous, you know, I can tell my friends, and use yes, yes, of course. So, uh, what are you in for, man? I am in for rape of little girl. Oh. Okay, uh, sure. What about you, Key Chicken? Right, I guess I should have expected that. So, Muhammad, what's he in for? He is in for dealing bath salts. What about you? Oh, uh, I accidentally, uh, killed a god. Did you kill Allah? Yahweh, so, yeah, I guess. I assure you it was accidental manslaughter. Also, I'm not guilty. Hey, Lord Fondlebottom, you got a visitor. No, not you, Key Chicken. Baron Samdi over there. I didn't expect anyone. Who is it? Oh, no. Hello. I'm scientist John Pendleton. No, 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 no. Here we have what's called the famous Tree of Life. <clears throat> and of course, we have the different uh, tips of this tree, our known plants and animals, insects, and creatures that we know. At the base of it is an amoeba, which supposedly all life has come through. Oh, I'm disappointed. Normally you give me a bunch of quick little things that I can make fun of you for, but this time you're just starting right into the main part of the video. I guess my entertainment will just have to wait. I don't think that amoeba is quite the correct term to use here, but it's close enough for me. And the reason is that you chose to use the word through rather than from when describing multicellular organisms' relationship to single-celled organisms. This implies that you believe that life did not originate with single-celled organisms, but rather that single-celled organisms were a later step in the evolutionary process. And that's good, that's correct. Single-celled organisms are actually exceedingly complex and definitely did not constitute the origin of life. That's actually quite impressive to hear a creationist admit. However, I know creationists, and in particular, I know you. And I'm guessing that I'm being a little bit too optimistic, and a little bit too generous. So what I'm going to do, is if you forget what you've just implied here, I'm going to remind you of it when I notice it. And of course, the whole idea is that um, life evolved, and that by mutations, and uh, beneficial mutations, genetic changes of the DNA, things got better and better. Better and better according to who? All that happened was that the things that could survive survived and the things that couldn't survive didn't survive? There's no better or worse here, it's just nature. The branches of biology, such as genetics, paleontology, that's the study of fossils, embryology, and comparative anatomy, fortify the theory of evolution of the species. Now, this is their statement. This is a publication by the Department of Education in Mexico. Any Department of Education in the world, you could probably find the same thing. So first, let's go with comparative anatomy. This shows us uh, different limbs from a salamander, a man, a bat, and a horse. And, of course, they all have parts that are the same names. Why? Because man has put those same names there. Oh, that pesky man. You know what? Let's take all the names off and replace them with gibberish. So now in our fun little confusing world, the salamander's phalanges are now called weeble wobbles, the human's phalanges are now called dangle fangles, the bat's phalanges are now called boopity boppities, and the horse's phalanges are now called cloppity clippities. And so now they no longer share a remarkably complex structure with a few variations which can and have been placed along a detailed evolutionary gradient, as evidenced by the mammalian fossil record and the placement of fossils through the various geologic layers, and which is reinforced by molecular phylogenetics. Right? Right? Now obviously, they definitely look similar to some degree. Not because they have a common ancestor, but because they have a common designer, a common creator. Well, I guess that's a yes from you in answer to my question, because you're just flat out ignoring all the evidence that I just mentioned. Now, <clears throat> Gavin De Beer is an extremely proficient embryologist of the 20th century. 
And he made this statement, but if it is certain that through <clears throat> genetic codes, the genes that code for different enzymes that synthesize the proteins are responsible in a way that we still do not know in embryology for the differentiation of the various parts of animals. What mechanism is there that can cause the production of homologous organs and their same patterns are not controlled by the same genes? He asked this question in 37. It was still unanswered in 71. It's still unanswered at this time. There is no answer to it. You can't get around it. The genes are different that control similar homologous parts in animals. So to summarize, you claim that if a species evolves from another species, the common traits, in this case the limbs, must necessarily be controlled by the same genes in both the ancestor and the descendant species. This is one of those claims which rather than being obviously flawed and a blatant lie that I can scream at you about, fails for more subtle and technical reasons. The National Center for Science Education has a fairly thorough takedown of the 2007 creationist book, Explore Evolution. This book makes a similar claim to what John is making here, and the NCSC's write-up addresses this topic of homologous features versus homologous genes in detail. Even though John's video was presumably made before the 2007 publication of Explore Evolution, because the book makes the same claim with the same agenda, it serves as a valid placeholder for whatever source this claim was taken from. I'll put the link in the description, and whoever's interested can judge the quality of the full work for themselves. But what I'll do is just put a couple points on the screen, and you can pause the video to read them if you want to. Now one of a real evangelist for evolution was Ernst Haeckel. He was a very fervent, diligent, he rented halls and packed it out, went traveling all over to promote evolution. Here we have a drawing of the life history of a simple organism. Guess what? It has a name called monorons, but they do not exist. It is simply a drawing. It is not, it is non-existent. So what appears to be some sort of creationist newspaper has a hand-drawn picture of a non-existent organism. You've given no details on the context in which it was drawn. If Haeckel indeed did draw it, you've given us no hint of the point that he was actually trying to make. What it's been used for? We know nothing about this image, and you're using it as an argument against evolution. It might be just me, but I think your argument is a little bit shaky. Mr. Haeckel had an assistant, and he asked him to bring him drawings, careful drawings, of a dog embryo and of a human embryo. These are seen at the top of our page. Can you tell distinct differences between the dog on the left and the human embryo on the right? One difference is the dog on the left appears to have been fucking stepped on. Why is its asshole all blown out? Very, very different. Well, Mr. Haeckel took these drawings and made some adjustments. Now you see at the bottom of the page the dog and human embryos look almost identical. I told you so. Evolutionists are very good at making excellent drawings of things that do not exist. That is not science. All right, first things first. You're using about the worst quality images I've ever seen. You can barely even see what they are. So what I've done is I've found better copies of these images online, and I've superimposed them over yours, just so people can see what you're talking about. You're welcome. Now, aside from the fact that in that first set of drawings you showed there's clearly a problem with the dog embryo, and aside from the fact that Haeckel clearly had multiple embryos to work with, as evidenced by the fact that he was able to draw this, which means that he was not necessarily copying off of that other drawing that you showed, let's pretend that Haeckel was a liar. Because typical pictures of embryos, they're squishy little things, they usually don't look much like those drawings at a glance. It's only once you compare the features that they do. And yes, he did tend to interpret a little too freely, I would say. The fact is, he wasn't a fraud and a liar. Maybe his drawings are inaccurate. Maybe he misinterpreted some things. Who knows? That's beside the point. Because scientists from 100 years ago don't define science today. But whatever. For our purposes, he was a liar. Now what? The point you're trying to make, I think, is that drawings don't prove common descent. And they don't demonstrate that there are similarities between different kinds of embryos. Fair enough. Do you remember what we discussed in episode 3? John, didn't we already discuss the fact that artist representations are not science? We talked about this in the last video. We've talked about this in this video. 
When the fuck are you going to drop this? Now granted, these drawings carry a little more weight because they're actually drawn by a scientist who is studying embryos. But the point is, if a hundred year old drawing is inaccurate, it doesn't disprove embryology. I hate to burst your bubble. And furthermore, we have a drawing here of Pithecanthropus alalus, which means the speechless ape. Here you have Mr. Speechless Ape and Mrs. Speechless Ape. Obviously, they had no marital problems as they could not talk. This was totally based on nothing. There was not one bone or skeletal reference. It was just a drawing that Haeckel made of his idea of the ape man and ape woman. Haeckel didn't paint that. It was given to him as a gift by the artist Gabriel von Max. At that time, no hominids were yet discovered, but Haeckel thought that there would be a theoretical link between ape and man if man evolved from apes. A perfectly reasonable and justifiable position, but apparently people made fun of him because he had the audacity to actually name it before it was found. Of course, we all know what happened after that. We have many, many hominid fossils. More links than he could have possibly imagined. So many that the ape-man gradient is effectively unbroken. Ernst Haeckel is best known for this series of embryos shown above here of a fish, salamander, turtle, chicken, rabbit, and human. I know what you're gonna say. They're just drawings. We've already covered it. One of the other icons of evolution is the famous peppered moth. Here we can see the black version of the moth on a lichen-covered tree and the light-covered one. Can you see him? Yep. Even with your shit quality images, I can still see him. He's looking diagonally towards the upper right. I can't either. Really? But he's there. Gee whiz. In the early 1800s, the white moth, or lighter color, tended to dominate in a 90-95% uh, portion of the population. The black or darker one was about 5-10%. to 10 God did it, right? God wanted the peppered moth to survive, so he made it black? I don't know for sure what you're going to say, but that's my guess. When the Industrial Revolution got into full swing, there was a lot of contaminants going into the air, and so the bark of trees was darkened. And so now you can see the light-colored moth much more clearly, and the dark one is less visible. Finally, the government said after a number of years that it was time to stop the so much pollutants and eliminate this. And, uh, and so the actual covering, the actual bark of the trees, became more of a transparent color, more the way that it really was, as we see in this picture. And then again, the population changed. I failed to mention when the tree was blackened like that, that the now the black or dark version of the peppered moth was 90 to 95 percent, and the white was 5 to 10 percent. A real change in population. Now that the tree barks are of a similar color, that the black moth is less of the population, 5 or 10 percent, and the white is a higher one to 90 to 95 percent. They said, there you have it. Evolution right before your eyes. Oh, I see what you're going to say now. You're going to say no new genetic information was added because both black and white moths already existed. Please, proceed. Well, in 1800 they were moths, white and black. In the Industrial Revolution they were moths, white and black. Today they're moths, white and black. That's not evolution, those are moths. And now we see clearly why you identify as a chemist and not as a biologist. The peppered moth is evidence of natural selection, not of gradual mutation. What it serves to do is specifically provide evidence for Darwin's version of evolution over other types of evolutionary theories such as Lamarckian evolution. That's the point they're trying to demonstrate. When the environment changes such that the different variations of a species shift in survival rate, you wind up with differences in the ratios of the different varieties of that species to each other. It's funny because it almost seems like you're accepting that natural selection occurs because you're accepting that the ratios of the different colors of these moths changed with the environment. So you've already accepted the main part of Darwinian evolutionary theory right there. You just haven't accepted the other part, which is that mutations plus natural selection equal change over time. Plus, all of these pictures of these moths are dead moths glued to the trees. In the natural, they are never seen on tree barks. The best indication is they hide in the high upper leaves of the trees. Are you really suggesting that the higher branches of trees don't have bark? This is deceptive information. It sure is. And the thing is, there's no evolution. They were always white and black moths. They still are. That is no evolution whatsoever. 
we didn't observe the origination of either the white or the black types of those moths, which is pretty much why nobody's proposing that they're evidence of the origin of variation within a species. You're the only person on the planet who thinks they're supposed to be. When you leave some food out, or some fruit that gets too long, you have these little bitty mosquitoes that form, little bugs, uh, flies that form. They're called fruit flies. Flies that form? Are you fucking kidding me using that kind of terminology? Please don't tell me that you believe that flies magically pop into existence when you leave food out. I wouldn't be surprised, but please don't say that. Drosophila is their scientific name, and they're able to be recently born and become parents within 10 to 15 days. They have an extremely short regenerative cycle. Okay, I don't think you're going to say that flies magically pop into existence, and I can't tell you how relieved I am. I don't have much respect for your intelligence, John, but I knew you had to be smarter than that. I guess it was just a poor choice of words. Now as far as your fruit flies thing, I've heard arguments related to this before. The one that pops into my head being, fruit flies generate quickly, therefore they should have lots and lots and lots of mutations, and evolve quickly in the lab for some reason. Is that what you're going for here? I don't know. Go ahead. And so they have been subjected over a period of a hundred years to all kinds of circumstances, chemicals, whatnot, to provoke mutations. Heat and cold, light and darkness, gases, uh, X, Y, Z rays, you name it, all kinds of things to produce different kinds of mutations. And then they've gotten them. Wait, what? You're admitting that mutations happen too? Here we have some of the fruit flies that have eight legs. This one has curved wings, just flies in circles. I don't believe it. Has Santa come? Are you finally giving up? Do I finally get to stop doing this stupid series? You're actually showing mutated flies. You're actually agreeing that mutations happen. You've agreed with both of the main concepts of modern evolutionary theory now. This is incredible, John. I feel like our relationship has been taken to a whole new level. I'm just gonna sit here and subject my audience to every single one of these fly drawings because this is the greatest moment of my life. I've been dealing with you for 11 months now. And finally, I don't have to do it ever again. Except maybe with UFOs. But other than that, good to go. You're accepting mutations. You're accepting natural selection. Little Johnny's finally growing up. This one turned out a lot darker colored. This one doesn't have any wings. What would you call him? A fly or a crawl? Swing and a miss. But you know what, man? It's okay. It's okay if you make bad jokes. Be silly. Be happy. Be your stupid self. It's cool. I don't mind. Little Johnny the Evolutionist. This one has uh, sapia eyes and this one has riato eyes. Now the thing is they've made many mutations. This particular version where it should have an antenna has another eye. And this one is the classic one because this one has four wings. Guess what? Four wings instead of two. Can't fly. You know, when you first mentioned this and I thought you were going to go on about how fruit flies never mutate, I actually went and looked up fruit fly mutations and that was one of the first ones I found. I expected I was going to have to find some decent pictures of a fruit fly with four wings and show it to you and shut you the fuck up, but you showed it yourself. And I'm proud of you, man. The wings are a hindrance. They don't even work. Can you imagine having an airplane that normally has two wings, now has four wings, but you still have the same size motor? It'd be kind of hard to get off the ground. Well... Yeah, unless they happen to align nicely like a dragonfly. But of course there's nothing that says a mutation has to be beneficial, just that sometimes it's not harmful. Where are you going with this? Once there was some fruit flies that turned out blind. Blind or eyeless? And why are you telling this like it's a fairy tale? Once upon a time there were some flies that turned out blind. Once upon a time where, when, and owned by who? You have no idea how much harder your lack of detail makes my job. But it's okay, buddy, I forgive you. I know it's just a bad habit left over from when you were a creationist two minutes ago. And so they set those apart, had them breed amongst themselves. In three to four generations, their sight returned. It's like the blind gene or the blind mutation wasn't accepted, and sight, which was part of the original program, came back. Well, I don't know about blind but I know that the eyeless trait is recessive, so I'm not sure what circumstances you're talking about. I mean, were all the original flies eyeless? And yes, I'm just assuming that by blind you mean eyeless, because I'm guessing that that's just a mistake on your part. 
I don't know, were some of the original flies eyeless and some of them unaffected? Did all of them carry the gene even if they weren't affected by it, or did some of them not carry the gene at all? And how many flies were involved in this experiment in the first place? Because that eyeless gene, I think you can just flip on and off. So the more flies you had in the experiment, the more chance you would have of that gene getting flipped back on. A fly with eyes coming back into the picture. You're not giving me much to work with. If you would provide a source, we could have a more meaningful conversation about this and get past it, but as it is, there's not much I can do, is there? And after some 33,000 different mutations, guess what? They are still fruit flies. Are you talking about one uninterrupted bloodline that had 33,000 different unique mutations without the end result being any different? Or are you talking about there have been 33,000 different unique mutations, but they've been spread out over different bloodlines when clean flies are brought in for fresh scientific experiments? I suspect that you're talking about the latter. I could see the former happening if you let the bloodline run on and get large enough, but I don't think that's what you mean. In which case, I don't understand the relevance of anything that you're saying. But you know, obviously none of this is relevant because you're an evolutionist now. You've admitted that flies can develop different coloration, and you've demonstrated that different coloration can be a beneficial trait, which results in that coloration spreading throughout the population based on environmental factors. So you've already admitted that evolution by natural selection happens. So I guess I don't really understand what the purpose is of the conversation that we're having here. All right, John, that's enough visiting. Let's go. You know, you're lucky you killed Yahweh, Uncle Pennybags, or he'd send you to hell for thinking like that. Thinking like what? Like at all? Yeah, that kind of thing's just plain unchristian, son. Ah, <sighs> so quiet without John around. Well, uh, mm. I don't know. Maybe I'll take a nap. Actually, uh, does this place have room service? Okay, what the fuck keeps happening? The editing keeps going weird and- Get the fuck- Get out of here, Osama Bin Laden. Mephistopheles, I know that's you now. <laughs> Listen, man, this isn't helping anything, okay? And I'm fucking stuck in prison. Either help me out or go away. I am God! There is nothing you can do. I will continue to mess with you as much as I want. And there's nothing. NOTHING that you can do to stop me! Come on, man. Just cut it out. It's not funny. If you want me to stop, you're going to have to make me. Fine. I will. Muhammad, key chicken. Who has an escape plan? Come on, I got nothing. One of you must have something. Why didn't you say you had those? Fine, doesn't matter. Let's go. Mohammed, it was interesting to meet you, but, uh... Listen, I'd let you come with us, but we don't really need child rapists running loose. I'm sure you understand. You son of bitch, asshole fuck! I will kill you! I will burn your house to the ground! I will kill your children and your children's children! I will kill your mother! I will kill your dog! I will marry your babies when they turn nine years old and then rape them! You son of asshole fuck asshole! When Allah returns, he will see that you burn in hell! Are you done? Yes, I am done. Cool. Well, see you around. Alright, now off to see the oracle. Ugh. I really need to jerk off. Hey, Oracle. Oh, it's you again. Look, I know we got off to a bad start, but Yahweh isn't around anymore, and I really need some advice. Well, you called me a bitch. Well, you were being a dick. You were asking stupid questions. Well, you didn't even greet me when I walked in. You didn't even knock when you came in. Well, you don't have a door. Irrelevant! Okay, look, I need to know how to vanquish a god. Without, you know, killing him. I already figured that way out by accident. But just answer that and I'll go away. Which one? Mephistopheles. Oh, him. He's been annoying me a lot lately, too. Right, so it's in both of our best interests if you help me to vanquish him. All right. I'll help you. Is that a...
Never mind. It says here, you must cast the object of his power back into the fires of Mount Doom, where it was forged. Well, I don't think it was forged. It's a cotton t-shirt beard. Are you sure that's the right page? How dare you contradict me! Get out of my office! Fine, but you really are a bitch. By the way, your wig's fallen off. <laughs> you failed, Logic. The living hell of bad editing will continue for eternity! Alright, let's not be son of a bitch. This ends now. You know what this gun can do. It killed Yahweh and it can kill you too, you motherfucker. So you better fucking stop pulling this stupid prank shit. Or I'm gonna come up there and stick this thing up your fucking ass. Jeez, alright. I'm sorry. I won't do it anymore. Goddamn right you won't. You'll need help, Logic, you crazy jerk. Yeah, 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 whatever. Listen, shut your mouth. I'm home. I'm gonna relax. I don't have to deal with John Morris Pendleton again. I don't have to deal with you again. So fucking shut up and let me get some goddamn sleep. <sighs> Finally alone. Hello. Oh, what the hell? Did you follow me home? The deep, the uh, lungfish of Africa is considered a classic example of evolution because it only has one lung. And first of all, the fossils of the lungfish are identical to the living ones. Well, yeah, I mean, nothing says an organism has to change over time. If it works, it works. And not only that, if there was significant change over generations and some portion of the descendants ended up significantly different from their own ancestors, that doesn't mean the other descendants would have to die out. Two species can exist at once. I know you might have trouble with that, but I know you're a real big fan of the Bible, so I'll give you evidence from the Bible. Noah's Ark. But I have to say, John, I'm starting to get worried. It almost sounds like you're starting to backslide on your declaration that evolution by natural selection occurs. Now, the lungfish lives in lakes and rivers of Africa, and when there's a dry season, just before all the water dries up out of the river or lake, these lungfish form themselves into a ball and bury themselves into the mud. The, dr the drought can go on for a month, three months, three years. When the waters and rains come back, the lungfish comes out, reproduces, and is perfectly fine. Exactly the way he was designed to be. Oh no. I really did get my hopes up for nothing, didn't I? You know, I really thought that we made a breakthrough together, John. Buddy, you have no idea how sad this makes me. And this means I'm going to have to continue on doing this shit all the way through your entire series. That is so many more videos that I don't want to do. You're tearing me apart, John Morris Pendleton. A creature of transition. The lungfish above, though classified as a fish, is a notable example of the phase of transition that the primitive fish could have known. Did you hear that? Huh? Could have known. Louder! Could have known. You gotta speak up, sonny. Or I'm going back to Matlock. Could have known. Would have shown. Did they see it? No. Have they tested it? No. Have they verified it? No. But could have known before converting themselves into amphibians like the salamander below. The only reason people say that is that you say that there's no possible form that could come between animals with only gills and animals with only lungs. There's an animal with gills and lungs. It blows your argument out of the water, even if that has nothing to do with that same evolutionary path. It does not matter one bit what ancestry that lungfish has. For all we care, it could be from a completely different origin of life. It doesn't fucking matter. The point is, there's a creature with gills and lungs, which means that a creature with gills and lungs can exist, and has existed and does exist now. So having both, or a rudimentary version of one and a full version of the other, can confer an advantage. It just demonstrates that there's a legitimately possible, useful, intermediate step. And by the way, who the fuck wrote this? Before they transformed themselves into salamanders? This was very obviously written by a creationist. But hey, I'm just gonna go away now and uh, transform myself into an elephant. So uh, I'll be back in a bit. Here's an interesting little bit of mutation. This husband and wife had twins. One's a white boy and one's a dark colored skin boy. They're both from the same man and wife. They're twins. It's just a 
strange mutation that happened that one was produced without melaline, lighter colored skin, the other one had more melaline. But they're still human beings, nothing really big about that. Okay, uh, the wife is darker than the dark baby. And what the fuck is melaline? Do you mean melanin? This African couple has three children that are albinos. They have a mutation that inhibits the production of melaline, which is the coloring that gives to our skin. Okay, so you do mean melanin. Very well done, speechless ape. Some more, some less. But the thing is, of course, they're human beings. They'll have to be careful going out in the sun as they don't have the melanin to protect themselves from the rays of the sun. And so they need to be careful. But they're still human beings. It is a mutation, though. Are you implying that we suggest that occasionally an organism has a child that is not the same species as the parent? Because that's impossible. And it goes completely against evolutionary theory and all of the principles of species classification. So if you're trying to use that against evolutionary theory, I would really recommend that you actually read a fucking book. One that wasn't written by creationists talking about lungfish transforming into salamanders. Then we have the famous bombardier beetle. You can say bombardier, but you can't say melanin? The bombardier beetle is a fascinating creature because inside of his body he has two chambers where hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone are stored. They're given certain inhibitors until the right moment when another inhibitor is given. So these chemicals mix and actually produce an explosion at 100 degrees centigrade. It's his way of protecting himself. Here we show a series where he's walking in front of a, a toad. The toad says, hmm, look at that. There's an easy lunch. The next picture shows the toad just about to gobble up the bombardier beetle, but the bombardier beetle had turned, fired his cannon right up the toad's mouth, and in our final picture, the bombardier beetle goes merrily on his way, and the toad is there with, oh, I got blasted in the mouth. And there's this video's ending stinger. Now how did the bombardier beetle figure out how to do that? It didn't figure out how to do that. Things don't figure anything out during evolution. You know that. Come on. Was it a series of mutations? You know, can you just imagine some night, mom, bombardier beetle's about to put one of baby bombardier beetle to bed, and all of a sudden you hear, boom! Mommy, what was that? Oh, that was your uncle. He didn't know how to mix the stuff, and he blew himself up. Ridiculous. Yep, it certainly is. They were doing what they were designed to do, and they do it quite well. Yes, the good old bombardier beetle. Always thought to pose such a problem. But of course, it's the exact same as the evolution from animals with gills to animals with lungs. All you have to do to blow the God did it hypothesis out of the water is show that there is a possible natural explanation for the evolution of one to the other in small, gradual, useful, or not harmful steps. Such as we've already done in this video by demonstrating that the lungfish exists and could be similar to an intermediate evolutionary step between gilled and lunged animals. But for the bombardier beetle, given that we don't have such an obvious potential example of an intermediate step, the explanation that's posited will need to be a little more complex, similar to the explanation that's given of how eyes would evolve. So do you remember what I do when things are too long for this video? That's right, make you go read it. Talk Origins, link in the description. Yes, I know I go to them in the NCSC a lot, but what can I say? You can find the creationist claims all over the place, but for decent debunkings, NCSC and Talk Origins are some of the better places to go. There's a 15 point possible natural explanation there, which along with every single other possible natural explanation must necessarily be refuted before the much more complicated supernatural explanation is even considered. In this London Natural History Museum Darwin exhibit, it says when weasels breed together, they produce more be weasels like themselves. Amazing. That's exactly what biology says. Weasels have weasels, cats have cats, pigs have pigs, dogs have dogs. That's the law of, of biology, according to their species, according to their kind. That's correct. According to modern biology, that is biology based firmly upon the theory of evolution by natural selection, no organism ever produces offspring that is of a different species from itself. Ever. For details on why species can't interbreed with each other, but why an individual organism can produce offspring which will eventually lead to a different species according to our classification system, I recommend looking into ring species. Potholer54's video on this explains it very well. And besides, it's Potholer, so it's going to be entertaining. Do dogs change? They most certainly do. Indifferent dogs. 
but they are still dogs. And they just have more and more dogs. It would be plausible for a Chihuahua to mate with a Toy Poodle, for a Toy Poodle to mate with a Basset Hound, for a Basset Hound to mate with a Beagle, for a Beagle to mate with a Dalmatian, for a Dalmatian to mate with a Bull Mastiff, for a Bull Mastiff to mate with an Irish Setter, and for an Irish Setter to mate with a Great Dane. We wouldn't be surprised to see any of those pairings occur in nature. But what about a male Chihuahua and a female Great Dane? This combination would be almost impossible to occur naturally, if only because the Chihuahua would need stilts. And the opposite pairing could turn out tragically for the poor Chihuahua. Chihuahuas and Great Danes are so far separate, and are so unlikely to ever produce offspring together in volume again, that if they continue to descend along those lines and become so much different, eventually their genetic material will be so different that they will be unable to produce offspring. Personally, I can't wait because it'll shut you the fuck up. And a poodle is losing constantly because of genetic manipulation, loss of information. We're not getting more, we're getting less. Oh, I'm sorry, that's just fucking made up. And actually, the poodle is cute and cuddly and kind of uh, look like a little sheep that they are. They're actually a tremendous problem of all kinds of congenital, congenital problems that they have. So loss of genetic variation due to inbreeding equals loss of genetic information due to descent? <laughs> nope. Um, that's what I thought. Comparing the Great Dane with the... Uh, the little chihuahua. We've already done that, John. Either I'm getting ahead of you or you've fallen behind me. But hey, maybe you'll have something new to add, so go on. There's a vast difference in size. They're both dogs, but they're, you can do all the genetical manipulation you want with the chihuahuan, and he'll never become a Great Dane. He's lost all kinds of information that he can never go back on. Always, the thing is, these manipulations of genes causes a loss of information, not getting new information. You could absolutely breed a Chihuahua into something that looks like a Great Dane. You just have to take your fucking time. For example, to get the size, you could just breed Chihuahuas with larger breeds. Or if you only wanted to breed Chihuahuas, you could just breed for size in your Chihuahuas. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but are you suggesting that smaller size is a result of having less so-called information in the genome? Now the thing I want to show you next is which, in my opinion, is God's favorite animal to make fun of the evolutionists. Do you know which one it is? That's right, the platypus duckbill. Please don't say it's a beaver cross with a duck. Let's take a look at what some of the characteristics of the platypus are. He has a bill like a duck, but it's fleshy. In other words, not at all like a duck. And the dissimilarities don't end with its fleshiness. It's just a big nose, the mouth is underneath it. If you can't name at least a few animals with big noses, you're probably not trying very hard. Just because it looks like a closed duck bill doesn't mean that it is one. Exterior fur like a bear. Fur or hair like all mammals, which in this case is not similar to a bear's. Internal fur like a sheep. Under fur, which is seen in many marine mammals. Lays eggs like reptiles and birds. Lays eggs like monotremes, because it is one. Monotremes being an early branch of mammals from before placental births evolved. Has a tail like a beaver. Has a flattened, swimming-optimized tail that one could reasonably expect to find on a semi-aquatic species. Gives milk like a mammal, but without nipples. Once again, monotremes are an early branch of mammals. Nipples evolved later. Is nocturnal like an owl. Give me a fucking break. Do you know how many mammals are nocturnal? Walks like a reptile. I'm assuming you mean because its legs stick out to the sides. Once again, it's an early branch of mammals. Quite an amazing little example of the evolution from reptiles to mammals, really. A living cousin of a transitional form between reptiles and mammals. What a handy little critter. Clucks like a hen. It sounds kind of more like a growling purr. Now, I'm not sure, but I think that type of thing is pretty common among mammals. Eats meat like a fish. I eat meat like a fish. Has web feet and is aquatic like an otter. Are you seriously shocked by this? Semi-aquatic mammals tend to have webbed feet. Uses sonar like the dolphins. Dolphins. Finally, we get to something interesting that isn't just, it's just like all the other mammals. And yeah, I'm sure platypus echolocation would be really fun to discuss if it existed. The male has poison like a serpent. Not really, there's no deadly component in it. About the worst you'll get from it is extreme pain. As a matter of fact, while the substances involved are generally similar, it doesn't appear to be related to reptile venom at all. It has claws like a rooster. It has claws like mammals and reptiles. Its eggs like those of a tortoise. Its eggs are more or less like those of a reptile because it's a monotreme. It's able to detect electrical impulses. Monotremes have free nerve endings in their snouts, which can detect electrical signals. The echidna's detection is relatively weak. The platypus's is better. The living ones are just like their fossils. Well, yeah, otherwise they wouldn't be their fossils. What is it? 
platypus duckbill. Where did it come from? Parents, platypus duckbills. What will it be? The platypus. Duckbill? And see, that's a real problem for evolution because it looks like so many different animals. It is a real problem for evolution because idiots like you don't actually figure out what things are. You just look at them and say what they look like to you. If you think the fur looks like that of a bear, then it's that of a bear. If you think the bill looks like that of a duck, then it's that of a duck. If you think the tail looks like that of a beaver, it's that of a beaver. If you think the venom is that of a reptile, then it's that of a reptile. It doesn't matter to you whether any of it actually is anything like the things that you're comparing it to, because if it isn't like the things you're comparing it to, it doesn't match your agenda. And as we have right now is here in Genesis 1, in chapters 11, 12, 21, 24, and 25, 10 different times we have after his kind, or the equivalent. God established the rule first. The funny thing is that after all these straw man arguments and flat out just made up things off of creationist websites, all this evidence that you've tried to present against the other point of view, you have not until now presented any evidence for creation. This is the first evidence you have presented in this entire video for your point of view. And I certainly hope that a very small percentage of my audience is impressed by you reading quotes from fantasy novels as evidence. Now one of the things that people have said is a real evidence of evolution. Okay, so the Lord of the Rings is the only evidence you're going to provide in this video for creation. You could have boiled your entire video down to just that one sentence about the Bible. I would have called Darwin's finches. There are some 13 finches that are found in the Galapagos Islands. And the difference between them are the different shapes of their beaks, according to different food supplies. But they're all the same kind. Ugh. We're skipping this one. We've already talked about this. I believe they had a common ancestor, and I believe it was a bird. I don't think it was a tomato. I don't think it was a, a penicillin or a fly. I believe it was a bird. And of course, it's a, that's the main thing. And that's all that they've ever been able to show. I just left this in there because I think it's hilarious. I don't need to respond to that nonsense at this point in the video, right? Over 100 years ago, a scientist named Weidersheim made a list of 180 structures and human organs that, according to him, were useless, evolutionary leftovers. After a century of scientific and medical research, we now know that all of them are important to humans. Some are absolutely vital for life. Two of the more famous ones we still have, one is the appendix. They say the appendix isn't worth anything. Two very interesting things. One is that the survivors of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima, Japan, those that still had their appendix suffered less from the radioactive fallout than those that did not have their appendix. John, if you're going to start saying shit about Hiroshima, to promote your bullshit creationist agenda and devalue the lives of all those people who died there, you better have some good fucking data. And I don't think you do. And also today, we're finding that people that still have their appendix do not succumb to as many diseases as those that do have their appendix removed. Uh, the appendix seems to serve some function in um, immunizing a person against various diseases, but when it's remo removed, that capacity is lost. Yes, it is thought that the appendix serves some function. You could have just said that and skipped the Hiroshima stuff. Also, the coccyx, that very tip end of your backbone, is called to be, well, that's just a leftover when you used to have a tail. Yes, and you can see that because we actually have a tail during part of our development in the womb. I would say that the actual tail that we grow is probably more evidence of a vestigial tail than anything. And the coccyx is not useless, so it's not vestigial in that sense. It's only called a vestigial tail because it's no longer useful as a tail. That's not true. I mean, obviously, everything has to have an end and a beginning. And in this case, the, our spinal cord has an ending with the coccyx. And a fucking tail. Others say that evidence of evolution is... Uh, bacterial resistance or insect uh, to antibiotics or in insects that are resistant to pesticides. Yeah. What we've been able to learn is that actually these bacteria that are resistant to 
antibiotics are actually the inferior bacteria. They lack the proper enzyme that connects with the antibiotic which eventually causes the bacteria's death. But because they don't have those right enzymes, the, the antibiotic does not affect the bacteria and so it lives. These are not the best bacteria, these are the ones that have already lost information. Okay, thing one, I am so fucking glad to hear that music. Thing two, if by losing an enzyme the bacteria lives, it's a superior survivor in its environment, therefore it's superior. I don't think you're talking about superiority or inferiority here, what you're talking about is information loss and gain, and I think your contention is that new genetic information cannot be produced, and it would be really nice if you would actually just make that claim instead of dancing around it like that. Google gene duplication, there's a start, have fun. As we look over this evidence, it's amazing that we see the creator. We don't see chance happening. You're really just rapid firing them here at the end, aren't you? Evolution is just chance. We already discussed natural selection seemingly hours ago, so why would you bring up chance? Natural selection is not a chance process. And we see the design that even with the mutations, they still stay according to their species, according to their kind. If you say so, dude, I know this isn't going to convince you anyway. Stay in tune. We have more interesting and helpful things to share that you'll get a lot out of and will be a really best blessing to others as well. God bless you. We'll see you soon. God's dead. I killed him. And I miss the bald old bastard. All those fun times we had. Getting drunk in the park. Throwing rocks at old people. Now all I've got is fucking Mephistopheles screwing up my editing. I sure wish Yahweh would come back. So brilliant, so destroyed, behold, Yahweh, you're back! Hey, buddy. You look good. Thanks. I had hair implants while I was gone. No! 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 You can't be back! You cannot be alive again! I am God now! I rule the universe. I control the editing. Go away. Go oh, away. Oh, stop it. Stop that. Uh, 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 go away. Get out of here. Are uh, oh, you a pig faced miscreant? What's this all about? I don't know, man. Same old shit. Let's go get a drink. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Ow. Yeah, that hurts, huh? Yeah, yeah, that it does. <laughs>